Okay, good Friday morning, everyone. Welcome to the Backyard Naturalist. My name is Tim. I have the great fortune of working at the Urban Ecology Center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'll give you full warning that today's episode kind of blows, kind of sucks, because we're talking about wind. Wind is the omnipresent force in our backyards. Sometimes you don't have it at all. Sometimes wind is gentle, gentle enough to move your hair a little bit, gentle enough to be a welcome breeze in the summer heat. Sometimes it's extremely powerful enough to take down your favorite backyard tree, uh, hopefully not onto your house. Uh, sometimes when wind is absent, we miss it so much that we create our own uh, with a fan, of course. And, and sometimes it's welcome, sometimes it's not, but it's a a huge part of our world, including our backyard. So we'll begin with our windy stories in episode 42 of season three of the Backyard Naturalist, Breeze the Day. Uh, as we do every week, just like to express my utmost thanks to members of the Urban Ecology Center. Thank you for supporting our mission to connect people in city to nature and to each other. And as always an extra special thank you uh, to those of you who are subscribers to the Backyard Naturalist. You keep this program going every week and you have enabled us to have a season four, which will begin in September. I'd be honored and humbled and grateful uh, for your support as a subscriber next year. We'll send a link along uh, soon. We're starting to put together a brand new season of talks, sometimes by Urban Ecology Center staff, sometimes by our fantastic guest lecturers, uh, partners in the neighborhood or, and around the world. There will be some in-person events and field trips, and I'm just personally really excited to keep this party going next year. So thank you again. A few quick points of interest before we get started is that this Sunday, July 17th, the Urban Ecology Center is teaming up with New Belgium Brewing Brewery for grown-up summer camp. I mean, really, why should we let the kids hog all of that summer camp fun? So we're hosting an afternoon of camp merriment and recreation. Uh, rock climbing, paddling on the river, arts and crafts, yard games, team-based challenges, and beer tasting. Bring your friends who are 21 or older to participate and make some new ones. Uh, for information, please visit our website. I'm also excited to mention that the UEC's community partner for the month of July is Orenda Cafe, which provides you with a very tasty way to enjoy your UEC membership. Uh, for the month of July, our friends at Orenda Cafe are offering a special deal for UEC members. If you buy one entree at full price, you'll get a second entree at a whopping 50% off. Uh, Orenda is delightful and delicious. Uh, it's a restaurant just a couple blocks from our Menominee Valley branch. They serve breakfast, lunch, and drinks and are just all around good neighbors. So we highly encourage you to go check them out this month. I also highly encourage you to tune into next week's Backyard Naturalist. I, this this Dog, dog is not eating this turtle, I promise you. Uh, guest host Rory Pulaski from the Wisconsin DNR will give a truly unique and it's got dogs and turtles, so sure to be adorable talk on how the DNR uses spaniels to help them study the endangered ornate box turtles. Uh, you talk about a unique pairing of animals fresh on the heels of Amanda's awesome talk on fun pairings of animals. And then the following week, we have this really fun mystery guest. We won't reveal who it is, so you'll just have to show up, uh, but I promise you it will be worth it if you do. Uh, in the mosquito episode a few weeks ago, I mentioned that we were uh, just on the cusp of receiving the first images from the James Webb Space Tele Telescope, and we got them, and they are incredible. If you haven't looked at the images, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, and it's, it's really hard to overestimate the importance of the telescope and these images and helping us to understand the universe. Uh, and as, as we get a glimpse of the very earliest parts of our 14 billion year history uh, as a universe, and this is just super exciting. There's, there's a lot of great resources online and, and I encourage you to do some, some exploration of your own into these resources. I'll send some links uh, in the next week's email as well. And this is my final presentation until September. So uh, I do quickly just wanna wish you all a continued wonderful summer of looking up at the skies and to let you know that some of the best meteor showers are just around the corner, starting with the Delta Aquarius meteor showers that are in a couple of weeks, July 28th, 29th, much like the spectacular Eta Aquarius earlier in the year, these showers radiate from the constellation Aquarius 
And because this year's show shower uh, coincides with a new moon, it gives us the best chances to see some really spectacular meteors in the dark skies and, and maybe even a few fireballs, which uh, fireballs are essentially bright meteors. They have a magnitude about the same brightness as the planet Venus. So they're, they're called fireballs. Really cool stuff. Um, then a couple of weeks later, August 11th through the 13th is the peak of the Perseid meteor shower, which is one of my personal favorites because it often coincided with our family camping trips up to northern Wisconsin. The Perseids radiate from the constellation Perseus, and you can get 150 to 200 meteors per hour. Unfortunately, this year's show coincides with a nearly full moon, uh, which dampens the spectacle a bit, but still worth watching. And Or you can just wait until after the moon sets in the really early hours of the morning uh, to try to catch some of the, the greatness. And then the other space news that kind of dominates the rest of the summer will be that several countries are going to be focusing on something closer to home, uh, lunar exploration. So starting with South Korea, which is planning on launching the, the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, which will launch from the Kennedy Space Center aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket around August 1st. And then around the same time, India is looking to launch the Chandrayaan-3 mission, which is its second attempt to land a rover uh, to explore the lunar surface after the first one ended in a dramatic crash. And then interestingly, there was a big crowdsourcing effort to try to find the, the crash site of the first one. And then a few weeks later in late August, Russia is hoping to launch the Luna 25 mission, which would be the first Russian lunar mission since the Soviet Union was around and it launched the Luna 24 back in 1976. So they're hoping to land a stationary unit that will study the regolith of the moon's south pole and then some of the dust and plasma that make up the, the very thin lunar atmosphere. So if you want to know what regolith is, you can check out our the, the moon episode of the Backyard Naturalist, which is available online. And then at about the same time, the United States is hoping to finally launch the much delayed Artemis 1 mission, which would be a precursor to getting people back to the moon. Um, we're ramping this up several decades after we visited for the first time. Okay, so uh, on to today's featured climate process, the wind. I just wanted to mention my main source of information this time uh, is to, to supplement my personal experiences is the good folks at the how Stuff Works, including the Stuff You Should Know podcast that helped me kind of frame this, the process of the talking about the wind because of it. it's so complex um, and so simple. The wind makes quite a few appearances in past episodes of the Backyard Nat Naturalist, especially during the episode on clouds. Um, and it will be likely mentioned again in the future. Uh, we've got one in the works on severe weather. And actually one of the coolest things about wind is that Wind is the process that allows for and really produces our weather. So really what weather is, is you take wind and then you add water uh, and that's essentially weather. So if you like weather, you can thank the wind. And then that leads us to the question, what is wind? In some ways, explaining wind is super easy. The concept itself is very simple. Um, the, the basic process is easy to explain, but then as soon as you start adding in the realities of the physical world that we live in, it gets really complicated really fast. And it's one of the reasons why we should give some slack to those folks that try to predict our weather for a living. But wind in and of itself is simply the result of air that is moving because of local differences in air pressure. If air pressure varies between locations, the wind blows. And that's as simple as it gets. Wind is the result of the world trying to be this great equalizer. The world wants air pressure to be the same everywhere. And when it's not, the air moves from the areas of high pressure to the areas of low pressure in the form of wind. And that's pretty much it. So we could end here, but then we'd miss some, some pretty fun stories. Um, and this is, this is actually an example where I think it's easier to, to discuss and explain in person when you can draw um, on a napkin or on a chalkboard. Um, but but uh, 
this this current format is fun and and we'll I'll do my best here. So probably the best example of demonstrating what wind is is just to imagine a balloon that is filled with air. The rubber sphere of the balloon is being stretched. And so the rubber is in a state of stress. And that rubber wants to get back to its original smaller form. And so the stretched rubber is putting increased pressure on the air that's in the balloon. That air is what's preventing that balloon from returning to the original state that it wants to. And the balloon doesn't like it, so it's adding pressure to get back. Um, the pressure from the balloon on the air inside the balloon is greater than the pressure of the air in the rest of the room surrounding the balloon. So a balloon is under constant pressure. The air inside of the balloon wants to get out. So again, that the, so that the air pressure can be the same everywhere. If you provide an escape route for that air by untying the knot um, that's holding the air in or releasing it, the air inside finally gets to leave in a stream of air and that stream of air is wind. The air moves from the area of greater pressure inside the balloon towards the area of lower pressure outside of it. So if you hold the balloon in your hand, as you open the hole, you can feel the air exiting the balloon. You can hold it up to your face, to your hand, uh, to feel that moving air, which is what we call wind. If you let go of the balloon, the wind pushes the balloon itself through the air until the air inside the balloon matches the pressure of the air outside of the balloon. And then the balloon goes limp and falls to the floor. So it's a simple process. We learn about it as kids, uh, but it's probably the best example of showing what wind is. If you make the balloon really big and there's a lot of stress, you blow a lot of air into it, you're creating a, a, a greater difference in air pressure. And then when you release a balloon that's really big and stretched, that wind, that exiting wind is more powerful. If you blow just a little bit of air inside the balloon, the difference in air pressure between the air inside and outside is very small. And if you open up a hole in that case, the resulting wind is much weaker. So big differences, strong wind, small differences, weak wind. Um, but this is all the result of air pressure trying to be the same everywhere and air moving from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So if air is constantly trying to equalize on the planet and you don't have balloons, what causes the differences in air pressure in the first place? And here on planet Earth, uh, the primary driver of air pressure differences comes mostly from heat, which comes mostly from the sun. So the sun's energy travels through space. When it enters our atmosphere, uh, it, that's not where the heat comes from. It doesn't come by heating the air when it comes in. Uh, heat is produced when those same rays are absorbed by objects on the surface of the planet. Uh, if the Earth's surface was entirely reflective, our planet would be a lot colder because all of the sun's energy would just bounce off of us and back into space. And that, that comes into play when we look at global warming and the melting of the ice caps, because you're going from a more reflective surface to a less reflective surface, which heats our planet more. Um, and our planet isn't entirely reflective. In fact, most of the things on the Earth's surface absorb that sun's energy and then radiate that energy as heat, which most importantly warms the air above the surface. So then when you have hot air, the molecules move faster. That causes the air to expand. That air becomes less dense, uh, which then with, with gravitational forces, the less dense air actually rises. Uh, because lower density hot air travels upward. Um, and then if you have that warm air rising, that's a, called a low pressure system. And because you have air rising, you, need, you, you can't just have an absence of air. So the, the air that's moving up has to be replaced. Um, and then if you have a low pressure system in, in one place, there's high pressure around it. And as air moves from high pressure to low pressure, the surrounding air moves in to fill in the gap that was created by the rising air. Uh, and then as the new air moves in, it also gets heated and then it also rises. So you have the stream of rising air uh, powered by the sun that's pulling air in from the surrounding areas of land. And if you happen to be standing in those areas, you feel that air moving as wind. The rising air then continues to push higher 
Um, and it also pushes the air in front of it higher. So it's like a, a, a true stream, but the air can't rise forever for two reasons. One is there's a very stable layer in the upper atmosphere called the tropopause that acts like a barrier to the air moving any higher. And then that hot air, as it rises, it cools, it becomes more dense and it starts to equalize with the air around it. So it can't really fall back to the earth in the same place because that's where this rising air column is. It's like if you get on an escalator uh, and it's, it's harder to turn around and go back down because the stairs are rising. And then if you put people on those stairs, it's really hard. Um, so that's why the air molecules don't descend where they are when they're cold. Um, but uh, as you, as like in an escalator, when you get to the top, you also can't just stay there because there's other people coming up that would push you around. So the air that gets to the top is pushed to the side um, before it can finally fall back to the earth. And uh, this is, oh, here we go. This is a, a, a nice little diagram of the process. So you first, you have solar energy reaching the surface, the energy absor is absorbed, the, the surface air warms and rises, uh, it becomes less dense as it rises, it begins to cool and contract, becoming more dense, and then the rising air equals the surrounding air and pressure, it stops rising, uh, but then the newly arriving air causes it to spread sideways until it begins to sink back to the earth. So this whole process is an example of what's called a convection current. And this is the primary driver of wind and weather on our planet. Convection currents can be found in many other applications and processes as well. For example, if you heat a water pot, what you're doing is you're or water in a pot, you're creating many smaller convection currents. So hot water is rising to the surface, it cools, and then it falls back to the bottom of the pot to be reheated, which causes it to rise again in a circular current. Inside our earth, we have hot magma that rises to the surface where it cools and then spreads before returning back to the mantle, which is why we have these suboceanic ridges uh, that cause the ocean floor to spread, causing the continents on them to move, uh, continental drift. And then as, the, as it becomes more dense and cooler, it goes back into the earth, into the mantle. And that's where we have subduction zones that produce all those fun volcanoes and earthquakes. So if we take this convection cell concept and now put it back on the earth, and to start with, let's pretend that the earth doesn't rotate at all, so that there's no rotation. If that were the case, in theory, our wind would be very regular, very predictable, and very constant. So the sun heats the air at the equator, causes low pressure to rise, um, the, the, the surrounding air moves in to feed the system, the rising air spreads in the upper atmosphere. And in this stable system, it, it would in theory spread all the way to the poles, which is the coldest and densest areas, which is also driving the system. Um, and then that cold dense air falls to the earth. So on the surface, surface winds would always head toward the equator. So if you're in the Northern hemisphere, the wind would always come from the North. In the southern hemisphere, the wind at the surface would always come from the south, but then in the upper atmosphere, it'd be the opposite. The upper atmosphere winds would head toward the poles uh, on either side. So if this were the case, <clears throat> meteorologists would have a much easier time predicting uh, the wind patterns, but this isn't how wind patterns work on Earth, primarily because on Earth, we, we live on a planet that rotates. And this creates the Coriolis effect uh, one of my all-time favorite of all the effects, at least top three, uh, the Coriolis effect or the Coriolis force. Then this is where this is where a chalkboard would be nice, but I'll do my best. So um, uh, let's see. So first of all, it's important to understand that the Coriolis force only comes into play when you have two layers that move relative to each other. So in the case of the Earth, you have the solid layer, the terra firma, planet Earth, that rotates. And then you have the atmosphere above it, which is a different layer. The two layers are not physically tied to each other, so the air can move freely above the planet, but they influence each other. And what's really cool is that the Coriolis effect 
it's it's more of a perceived difference from our perspective than an actual effect. So there's no changes to the laws of physics. They're still doing what they always do, but this force comes into effect uh, when you have two things moving relative to each other, um, just like when when a train, uh, similar to when a train goes past you and it and it appears that the Doppler effect that the that the frequency changes. The frequency isn't changing, but it's changing relative to your ears. So, for example, if you're in an airplane and that airplane is on the tarmac, you are part of terra firma, you're part of the earth, you're physically connected to it. So your speed and location on this rotating planet depends on the speed and location of the tarmac and the earth you're connected to. But the very moment you take off, you are now part of the atmosphere layer, the layer that's above the earth, and you're no longer connected to that rotating planet. So if you take off from Milwaukee and you go somewhere exotic like Los Angeles, uh, the minute you go up in the air, you are disconnected from both Milwaukee and Los Angeles and the rotating Earth. So your airplane isn't going to go to the place that Los Angeles is now. The plane needs to go to the place that Los Angeles will be when you land which is just a fun and crazy concept to think about. It's like, it's like when a quarterback throws to a wide receiver or, or you kick a ball to somebody, you don't want to throw it or kick it to where they are now. You want to throw it to where they will be uh, in, you know, so that that gets time and space. Um, so if I drive from Milwaukee to Los Angeles, I don't have to worry about this because I'm always connected to the earth and, and everything's moving the same way relative to, to each other. But when you fly, this becomes a thing. And it's why flight paths can never really be straight. They're always curved relative to the surface of the earth. So from the perspective of you on the plane, it looks and feels like you're going straight to Los Angeles. But if you map out the actual flight plan, it's always curved because you're hitting a moving target. Um, and so relative to the surface of the earth, it's not going to be straight. If it were straight, you'd have to fly in a funky pattern and waste your time um, and gas. So then the other thing that comes into effect here is that not only is the planet rotating, uh, different parts of the earth by necessity on a, on a sphere are traveling at different speeds. So if you're at the equator, um, without doing anything, just sitting in your chair, you are traveling the circumference of the earth in 24 hours. So with the bulge, it's, it's about 24, 25,000 miles. Um, so person at the equator without doing anything is traveling 24,000 miles around the earth in 24 hours, which makes the math easy. So you're traveling at about a thousand miles an hour without doing anything. If you run in the Easter, in an easterly direction and you run at five miles an hour, then technically you're really running a thousand and five miles an hour. Um, but by doing nothing, you're, you're traveling a thousand miles an hour around the earth. A person at the equator, also standing still doing nothing, is also, let's say, I'm sorry, at the pole. So that was a person at the equator traveling 1,000 miles an hour. If you're at the pole, or let's say you're just south of the pole at, at like one degree, 89 degrees north, so just a degree, degree south of the North Pole. Also by doing nothing, you're still traveling, but in 24 hours, you only are traveling 70 miles, give or take. So someone at the poles by doing nothing is traveling east at a speed of about three miles an hour, much slower than the person doing nothing at the pole at the equator who's traveling at a thousand miles an hour. So if the person at the equator had a really good throwing arm and tried to throw a ball to someone at the North Pole, if the earth were not rotating, the ball would just have a clear path and travel to its intended course but put these same people on a rotating planet, before the ball even leaves the person's hand, the person and the ball are traveling a thousand miles an hour to the east. So when the person throws the ball, assuming no friction, the ball is still continuing to travel eastward at a thousand miles an hour, even as you're throwing it north. And that's the, the physics of, of conservation of momentum. So pretty soon in an interesting, weird twist, that football 
is going to start traveling faster to the east than the ground and the objects on the ground below it. So uh, relative to those objects, that ball is going to start traveling faster to the east. And it, it the, the ball is going to take a curved path. Even if you throw it due north, because it's already traveling at 1,000 miles an hour east and the person at point B is not traveling 1,000 miles an hour to the east, the ball is going to go faster to the east than the fixed object. Um, so it that's what causes objects moving north and south, if they're not fixed to the planet, to veer east um, in the northern hemisphere. So here's a kind of cheesy, I apologize for the cheesiness, but it is a pretty interesting video um, that demonstrates this, this process uh, in a different way. With a simple game of catch, I think I've found a way to show an effect that will have you doubting your very own eyes. Now, they don't know it yet, but our budding ball players sitting on our specially rigged merry-go-round are about to demonstrate a rather astonishing optical illusion. Right, here's the game, right? You're going to throw the ball straight. So what's your name? Victor, right? Yeah. But this time, I'm going to complicate things slightly. I'm going to rotate to the merry-go-round counterclockwise. So you throw it whilst it's moving. What's going to happen? I don't know why, but I feel like if we're going fast enough, yeah. like I might actually be the one catching the ball. OK, so you're going to throw it and you're going to catch it. All right. Yeah. What's going to happen, dude? I was going to veer off to the left. So the ball is going to swim off to the left. Yep. And you might catch it. Possibly. Okay, good. Right. So what's going to happen? <laughs> I think it's just going to come straight to me, and I'm going to catch it like the champion that I am. Show me the catch. <laughs> okay, great. Right. Okay. So everyone, no, hang on, one more. He's Spencer. Not, he's not arrogant. Just quietly he's confident. He's not catching it. I'm he's really? not catching it now. So what's going to happen to the ball? I'm catching it. It's right here. Great. So we've got one second to go off to you. One saying comes to you, Spencer, and you think it goes straight ahead, but you think you'll be the one catching it. Yeah. Now remember, the ball will be thrown straight across the spinning merry-go-round, but where will it end up? Will it be caught by the thrower? Will it be caught by the person opposite? Will it be caught by the person to the thrower's left? Or by the person to the thrower's right? Oh, right, in your own time, throw the ball! I got this! Oh, 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 oh. So the answer was D. It was caught by the person on the thrower's right. Our camera angles seem to show the ball bend in the air. So is that a camera effect, or are we seeing what they saw? Hang on, this, go this couldn't get much more simple. The idea was just to throw the ball straight to Victor to show us his amazing catching skills. That's right. Yeah, it did. It just curved, just curved right over here, this way. So let me get this straight. So you threw, somehow you threw the ball, it left your hands, and then what? And then it just got sucked over to him. In the air? Yeah, and threw a perfect <laughs> throw. What yeah. did you see? <laughs> yeah, curved right in. Right, so we all agreeing here the ball curved in midair. Yeah. Yes. And you didn't put, you didn't cheat this at all? No, I didn't. OK, and do you know why it did that? No. Nope. No idea. It's called the Cornelis effect. And it's very simple. It's objects in motion appearing to be, it's an optical illusion, appearing to be deflected off their intended course. So what's actually happening here is you are throwing this ball. You can only throw a ball in a straight line. Can I clear that up straight away? Yes. Even though it appears in your eyes to be bending. So you throw the ball straight. It's still going straight. But the table is moving below you. And all of a sudden, look who's in front of that straight moving ball. And it looks like it's bent off to the right because you're still looking at the guy you were intending to throw it to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a cold illness effect. So that's not exactly the same thing that happens on Earth. Um, that's that's uh, objects that are rotating in in um, relative to a, a line being thrown straight. So it's, it's a slightly different explanation, but it's pretty much a, a, a good way of thinking about how the Coriolis effects work, that if you're throwing straight relative to these other ob moving objects, it looks as if um, the, the ball is moving to the right. And that only happens because the Earth is spinning. If the Earth weren't spinning, everything would be, just be like the way you expect it. Um, so then if you were to run oops, that same exercise in the Southern Hemisphere, um, the exact same thing will happen, except that the deflection would go to the left. And if the back to the let's just sorry, back to the northern hemisphere alone, uh, look at the two arrows, kind of ignore all the words. If you look at the two arrows, uh, the 
imagine there's a person and the and the equator throwing it north. We already looked at that and saw why that would veer to the right. If the same thing would happen if that person on the equator would try to throw that ball south, that when when they throws the ball, that ball is moving pretty slow up there, you know, just a few miles an hour to the east. And now it's moving into areas that are moving faster than the ball. And so it appears that the, the ball moves slower relative to the ground. So no matter where you are on a planet that's rotating to the east, in the northern half, the Coriolis is always going to make objects move to the right. Now, remember that wind is constantly moving north and south, and that wind is part of the atmosphere. And so that wind is also deflected relative to the surface of the Earth. Um, so here, if you, if you do the exact same thing in the southern hemisphere, the same thing happens except the deflection appears to go to the left. Um, and you can kind of do the math if you think about it and, and relative speeds, it, it still works. It's just a mirror image. Um, so it's, it's essentially why hurricanes in the north travel in a clockwise direction uh, and hurricanes in the south travel in a counterclockwise direction. It has nothing to do with flushing toilets, though. That's a totally separate thing. But uh, in terms of, of uh, air currents on the surface, this, uh, that's what, what, what causes it. And so just one more really short uh, video to help kind of explain this in a different way. Picture a circle. Here's its center, here's point A, and here's point B. Point A is twice the distance from the center of the circle than point B. Oh yeah, and it spins from its center. In two seconds, both points do one full revolution. But to go all the way around, point A has to go this far, while point B only has to go this far. And we all know if something travels a greater distance in a shorter amount of time, it must be going faster. So point A must be moving faster than point B. Okay, now swap out this flat circle for the Earth, and the same thing is true. All points closer to the center say like someone in Greenland will be spinning slower when compared to points spinning further away from it, say like people in Brazil, closer to the equator. So if we look at it all flattened out, we can picture something like this. Arrows at the equator travel faster than arrows at the 45 degree line like we just observed. Now imagine you're a cloud that formed here on the equator. You'll have the same velocity as the Earth, but then a gust of wind sweeps you to the north where the Earth isn't spinning as fast. Due to inertia, your speed remains the same. You don't get any faster, but everything around you is literally traveling slower, so you, relative to the ground, move ahead of everything else. If you're a cloud that forms at the 45 degree line, you'll also have the same speed as everything around you. But if you drift down to the equator, you'll be moving slower than the ground underneath you, so you'll fall behind. And the same things for the southern hemisphere. Moving towards the equator always results in falling behind, while moving away results in pushing ahead. Okay, now imagine a low pressure cell. That means all the air around it will get sucked into the center. But the air coming from the equator will be traveling faster, so it will deflect to the right, while the air coming from the poles will be moving slower, so they'll fall behind and deflect to the left. What this results in is a circular air current spinning counterclockwise. And that's exactly what hurricanes are, low pressure cells spinning because of the Coriolis effect. Moving this example down to the southern hemisphere, things are reversed. A low pressure cell will still suck in the surrounding air, but now the air coming from above will be moving faster, again deflecting to the right, while the air coming from below is moving slower, again falling behind by moving to the left. This results in a clockwise spin, which is why storms in the southern hemisphere spin this way. Uh, and that's about it. It's a short video, and that's kind of the point. I hope you got what you came for. Uh, and the Coriolis effect doesn't really influence toilets, they're just really too small, and the direction of the spin more depends on the placements of jets inside the toilet. But that's it, that's the Coriolis effect. If you liked this short and to the point video, give this video a like, and if you want to see more videos like it, why not subscribe? I'll be back next week with another video, so until then, thanks for watching. I think I, um, I think I said it wrong before the video. I think I said that storms in the, in the north move in a clockwise direction. Part of the interesting thing about that is even though uh, when you're, if you're in the storm or if you're out of the storm, it's going to be slightly different. So even though the air is deflected in a clockwise direction, when you, when you're in the storm, the storm itself moves in a counterclockwise direction. It's like being 
you know, it kind of like if you're saying to the right or left from my perspective or your perspective, but either way you get the, you get the gist. Um, so if we go back to the diagram, the, the Hadley convection cell, again, this is what would happen in a non-rotating stable earth. We'd have the stable system, but when you add the rotating earth, uh, what happens is that the air that's traveling north and south gets deflected through the Coriolis. And then this destabilizes that whole system that would have been one large convection cell. It gets broken up into two major convection cells. So you still have the Hadley cell that's driven by at the equator by that upward hot air, that motion, that convection cell, as we saw earlier. You still at the poles have that convection cell that's driven by the cold air pressure moving down. But the deflection of the air from the Coriolis destabilizes the system, which results in two major drivers and then a third, uh, a third cell called the, the feral cell. Um, and the feral cell is driven by the friction from the Hadley cell on one side and the polar cell on the other side. So it's like if you put a, a, a rotating gears together, um, and if you have two gears that are moving the same direction on either side of you, you have to move in a, in a different direction. So the feral cell moves um, in the opposite direction than the Hadley cell and the polar cell. Um, we, we talk a little bit more about this in the cloud episode about how this, uh, this system, when you add moisture and water, uh, really drives the pattern of earth about where we have rainy areas, where we have rainforests, and where we have dry deserts. And that's a really fun, fun pattern. Um, and then if you add to the fact that the earth now is, is not only rotating, but tilted at 23 and a half degrees, the locations of these cells relative to the latitude lines are always changing too. So that's, that's why you have, you have seasons. Um, and, and so in our simple system, the Hadley cell was driven at the equator, but because the equator shifts with the tilt, uh, that system is only at the equator twice a, twice a year uh, because of that, that tilt of the earth. So the, the energy that, and the bottom, in the bottom graph here is at the equator, the upward intertropical convergence zone actually migrates north and south with the seasons. So during the summer solstice, the, that rising current that's at the equator in the diagram will actually be 23 degrees north of the equator and at the winter solstice, it'll be 23 degrees south. Um, and then at the equinoxes, it'll be right there at the equator in the, in the simplest form. And then another byproduct of the Coriolis on the convection cell is, is that the air, uh, at the, the air at the boundaries of the cells in the upper atmosphere, um, because of the Coriolis, they start to spread out, they veer into a system that becomes a fast moving system to the east, which is called a jet stream. So there's a jet stream in the upper atmosphere between the polar cell and the feral cell or the temperate cell here. Then there's another jet stream in the upper atmosphere between the feral cell and the Hadley cell. The, the one in the north is called the polar jet stream. That's the one that influences us most here in Wisconsin. And then there's a slightly weaker subtropical jet stream. And if we take a, a step back, this angle shows that the jet streams themselves are moving eastward relative to the surface of the earth. Because there's pressure and wind, it's actually moving faster than the surface of the earth. And the polar jet stream tends to have greater pressure differences between the temperatures in the north and the temperatures in the temperate zones. Because of that, it's stronger. Because remember, stronger pressure differences produce stronger winds. And so the polar jet stream is much more powerful than the subtropical jet stream. Um, and it, it moves to the east at about 200 miles per hour faster than the surface of the planet. So if you're a pilot and you want to get from west to east fast, uh, you can take your plane into that jet stream and you're essentially adding about 200 miles an hour, um, you know, give or take, uh, to your speed. And it's, it's like if you're in an airport and you're walking on one of those moving sidewalks, if you get onto that moving sidewalk, your, your relative speed is much faster. Even though you're walking at the same speed, the ground is moving with you. Um, and so pilots can tap into that and move. You, it's, off, it's often times that you'll get, let's say from Seattle to Milwaukee will be much faster than the return trip because of the pilot can tap into that polar jet stream. 
And then the opposite way, you might be fighting that jet stream. Um, you know, you can try to get out of it too, but uh, that'd be like moving backwards on that moving sidewalk. You'd move actually slower. Um, so uh, we'll take one more, one more final, just because these videos really help uh, solidify this look at the jet stream. Miles above our heads, massive rivers of air greatly affect life here on Earth. Jet streams are currents of strong wind high in the atmosphere, and these winds can reach speeds of more than 200 miles per hour. Like many weather patterns, jet streams are caused by temperature and pressure differences around the globe. Warm air rises, creating low pressure. Cold air sinks, and that's high pressure. Combined with Earth's rotation, these pressure differences force air to move around the Earth, usually west to east. The bigger the pressure difference, the stronger the wind. Jet streams can be thousands of miles long and rarely blow in a straight line. They must flow between shifting high and low pressure systems, just like a meandering river. Because jet streams usually separate hot and cold air, their peaks and dips often determine who gets rain or shine. A jet stream can help steer a hurricane to a destructive landfall or turn it harmlessly out to sea. When a jet stream pattern gets stuck, flooding rains or prolonged drought can result. Jet streams are a major influence on our daily weather. They are also a big challenge for weather forecasters trying to predict the future course of these rivers of air. So when you, when you hear the term polar vortex uh, in, in the weather, that means that the polar cell has become much more powerful, that cold descending air moves south. It pushes that jet stream boundary farther south, which means that here in, in Wisconsin, we might get stuck in a very powerful and stable high pressure uh, cold weather Arctic system that just might sit and, and, and not move at all. And, and then finally some other system comes and pushes it forward. But just the fact that the jet stream itself is, is, is not a simple line. Um, again, you, you see why, why weather can be so hard to predict uh, even, even just a few days out. Um, so jet streams can do more than just move planes uh, faster. They can also pull ash from a volcano and in the high atmosphere system spread it across the world. Uh, recently with the wildfires in the Pacific Northwest and the West Coast, um, a lot of that smoke was pulled into the jet stream and quickly moved to the east, and we, we, we could see those effects um, here in Wisconsin. And so, you know, maybe the, the biggest takeaway here is that we made that journey from that the simplest form of what wind is with the balloon. It's just pressure differences. But then when you add all these elements like solar heat, the convection cells, the Coriolis effect, it gets complicated quickly. And so I just sometimes I need to revisit these basics uh, over and over again to help to help understand the more complicated things. And then there are more layers of complexity that that we haven't gotten to um, that, again, on their own are fairly simple. But then when you add them to this already complicated system, uh, it, it adds the, the complex, more complexity, more unpredictability. But but to me, that's what makes the whole thing really fun. Um, so one example is that, you know, we mentioned the sun heats objects on the surface of the Earth. But the landscapes on the surface of the Earth are varied, so different parts of the planet are heated to different degrees. So you get these local systems, uh, and this is this is really evident here in Milwaukee when you look at the land and water boundaries, um, and you hear the phrase "cooler by the lake." Um, well, that works because the sun's energy is hitting both the land and Lake Michigan, but the land absorbs more heat than the water, so the air above the land becomes hotter and drives the rising air, the, the air above the water is cooler, denser, uh, and higher pressure. So that moves in inward to the lower pressure to, to equalize that pressure. So the high pressure in the, in the lake air moves in to the land. Um, and this is pr what produces those, those wonderful uh, summer breezes off the lake. And sometimes it's really pronounced. I know sometimes a I'll leave my house on 45th street on a bike in shorts and t-shirts and I head toward the lake. And then all of a sudden, by the time I get there, I I'm, I'm cold. Um, I need pants and long sleeves. And sometimes it's like you're hitting a, a just a wall of cold air. Um, and then interestingly, that process can reverse 
uh, especially when the air on the land, when the land cools more quickly, it has a, a water retains heat more easily than land. So if the land cools more quickly, then you get the opposite of the sea breeze and you get uh, the breeze moving from the land to the water. But we're usually sleeping when that happens, so we don't notice it as much. Um, and another, another just important factor that affects wind is, is just the, the surface of the earth is not flat. There are objects, there are mountains, and those objects interfere with the wind. Sometimes they block it, sometimes they reroute it, sometimes they funnel it. So, it, you know, some of the windiest places on the planet are on the tops of mountain, not only because you're exposed to the wind that can hit you unimpeded, there's nothing to block it, but then you're also getting wind that is impeded and gets funneled up and concentrated, uh, particularly at the top of a mountain. So the, the, the place on earth that has the recorded the windiest gust of wind, the, the, the strongest gust of wind not associated with a hurricane uh, was Mount Washington in New Hampshire, where a wind gust reached 231 miles per hour in 1934. And that record still holds today. Some will say that there's a place in Australia that had a 253 mile per hour gust. And while that is true, that was also part of a, a hurricane system. So it's kind of a slightly different. Um, and tornadoes, you can get winds of over 300 miles an hour. But for a non-cyclonic system, uh, Mount Washington produced a 231 mile an hour wind gust. And it's still one of the most windiest and most dangerous places um, in North America for sure. And then as the wind is funneled over the mountain, on the other sides, beside affecting rain on one side versus the other, uh, it, it causes a lot of disturbance to the air on the other side. And that can make, um, that can be really dangerous to, to particularly helicopters, but sometimes airplanes. And it's why uh, sometimes flying into Las Vegas can be an adventure uh, because of the, the, the turbulence on the, on the leeward side of the mountains. So uh, we'll, we'll wrap things up for now. There's, there's just so much more to say about wind. Um, and uh, in addition to being, you know, it, it being fun just to, to figure out conceptually, uh, it influence, influences us in other ways. Wind is, it's fun to watch waves, which are produced by wind, fun to surf in them. Um, it has a huge impact on coastlines uh, in terms of erosion, both wind and water wave action caused by wind. Wind disperses seeds, so it's super important for, for life, particularly conifers, um, but also for wildflowers, as anyone who blows on a dandelion can attest to, or anyone who's seen a tumbleweed, uh, because as a, the wind pushes the tumbleweed along the ground, little seeds start to fall off, and so it's a dispersal system. It wears down mountains. The Appalachians are much smaller today than they were because part, in no small part to, due to wind. Um, over the millennia. They can carry nutrients uh, across oceans. They, it's one of the reasons that it's thought that the Amazon rainforest is so lush is because it continually gets mineral rich dust from the Sahara. Um, and we will end with our little moment of Zen uh, from the top of the aforementioned Mount Washington. And that guy was only in 109 mile an hour winds, uh, which is about half of what the record was there. So thank you for joining me today. We'll see you next week. I will stop sharing my screen.